He borrowed it or won it on a bet or something. He willingly pays taxes on the car, and because he is a graduate engineer, he tinkers the thing back to life whenever he stops at Maria. If you like your property claims neat and orderly, Maria will drive you mad. Pity thievery, a kind of game which everyone plays, is not considered immoral. The fact that a good Moran friend will walk off with a few flashlights, a bottle of wine, or the head of a baked pig should not disturb anyone who wishes to live in paradise. But it does. A Moran caught taking a flashlight or a bottle of cologne will not apologize. He may hold the objects out to you. He may ask if he can have them. But if you use the word ya to steal, in reprimanding him, he will be mortally offended. This disregard for ownership seems a slight thing, but it can wear away at the nerves of an American until he spends hours hoarding all his portable objects. Many Americans who thought they were free of property obsessions finally leave the island with a burning sense of outrage at the Morans. Before going to our house, we always stop for a beer with Hugh, Jay, and Muck at their hotel. Partly it is because we are thirsty, but mostly it is to catch up on gossip and to see the new Bohemians. Girls come and go rather rapidly on Morea, as indeed they do in all of Polynesia. The performance, style, and manners of the Bohemians are a major element of conversation on Morea. The relations between a man and his vahini are structured, well understood, and utterly public. Our conversation on the terrace by the Bali High is, I suppose, body by Western standards, but there is no other informal way to talk. Even when we are speaking of yachts, big fish, a successful feast, or a business deal, the conversation tends to be in a sexual colloquialism. It is part of the Tahitian tradition. There is no separate vocabulary for children and a secretive coarse one for adults. In a few moments, our children drift away, bored by the conversation. Michael, six, goes to the quay, rolls into the water with his face mask and snorkel, and begins to catalog fish. Maggie, eight, goes out with two of her friends to gather flowers for lays, and by dinner time, they will have coronets for all of us to wear. Katie, 13, goes to the local Chinaman's, the South Sea generic name for store, to see some of her friends, listen to the radio, and demonstrate the twist. After a few beers at the Bali High, we wander over to our house, which is a large coconut thatched affair. Hippolyte Pittman, our pure-blooded Polynesian neighbor, is waiting there with a gift of a huge, luscious grapefruit, some breadfruit, and a string of freshly caught lobsters. We gossip, inquire about his children and grandchildren, press a liter of Algerian red upon him, and some bubble gum for the children, and a lipstick for his wife. Then we go to work. My wife starts to clean the house, to spray for mosquitoes, repair old mosquito nets, and wash pareos. I take off with Hugh, Jay, and Mutt for a distant river valley to spear some freshwater shrimp. On the way, we stop below Dick Gump's house, which is located on a steep hill, and yell up at him. Dick is like me, a perennial, not a permanent dweller. Back home on the mainland, he owns and manages the famous Gump store in San Francisco. He is sweating and waves us off, suggesting we drop in for a beer later. Right now, he is trying to get water pressure in the pipes of his beautiful home, which has one of the most majestic views in the world. When we get to the valley, the three managers of the Bali High take off like goats. Their feet are as tough as thong leather, and as they move easily over rocks and tree stumps, 
They are constantly grabbing ripe mangoes, papayas, limes, and breadfruit to take back to the hotel. They stop at a small experimental garden where they hope to prove that vegetables such as sweet corn, tomatoes, and lettuce can be raised in the valley. They curse at some unknown bug which has attacked the lettuce. We have to wait until darkness comes before going shrimping. Hugh, Jay, and Muck spend the time furiously hoeing corn while I watch the sunset. It is the time when mood, color, temperature all quickly change. The valleys turn a deep purple black at the same time that the distant trade wind clouds become a soft pink. Far away on the reef, the figures of men are suddenly visible. Black, slow moving, featureless forms harvesting the reef. A pirogue moves across the lagoon, and the water is so still that it trails an expanding V behind it for half a mile. Then, abruptly, it is almost totally dark. Hugh, Jay, and Muck give up their gardening, and we light kerosene lamps and head for the river with our short-pronged spears. In two hours of slipping and falling and climbing, and some successful spearing, we gather a big basket of shrimp. We leave the river and drive back to Mariba, stopping along the way to visit the Medford Kellams, a dignified couple who speak Tahitian and work a large plantation, and to have a beer with Dick Gump. We discuss whether Dick's new house, beautifully designed and built, can withstand the high winds of January. It is a weeknight, so we eat promptly and are in bed early. If it were a weekend, there probably would be a party at the Bali High or somewhere else and we would go to bed very late after hours of dancing and a huge meringue feast. This is a typical day in paradise. How could such a place be anything but irresistible? How can this soft and luscious island turn most white men into irritable and finally angry and disillusioned men? Some of them, those who cut their bridges too dramatically when they left home, drift off into alcoholism. Others return to Papieti and become sybarites, seducing the local girls with a kind of low-pitched disgust for themselves and their conquests. With a gentle touch, the French officials soon ease such characters away from the islands. It may be difficult to comprehend but this lovely island can be corrosive to a Westerner. Its very virtues, in some paradoxical way, become a form of punishment. A place can be too beautiful. The sea, the reef, the flowers, the clouds, the sunset are magnificent when viewed for the first time. Two weeks later, they are still beautiful, but by then you have a vague sense of surfing. Two months later, if you cannot ignore the gorgeous physical surroundings, if you must look, it can be almost nauseating. It is comparable to eating too much of an exquisite but very rich meal. The permanent white residents of Morea have learned to look away from its splendors, to enjoy them sparingly. Note that Hugh, Jay, and Muck ignored a spectacular sunset and went on with their gardening. It was a protective gesture, for they are not insensitive men. There is no intellectual dialogue on Morea. None.